and language teaching and learning. So we're all language uh, teachers and uh, we've all been language learners at some point. And I'd like to talk about uh, interactivity from a variety of perspectives. When we think about interactivity, of course, in this age, our mind springs to the idea of computers. But actually, we have interactivity in many other ways. We have interactivity between the teacher and the student, between the uh, between uh, students and other students, and the, and all of us with the community, as well as with technology. So we're going to be investigating some of those ideas as we go through here, with a particular focus on learning materials and how do we get the most out of those learning materials uh, in the 21st century. But first, I want to start with an old book, an old book. Uh, this is something you have a lot of difficulty finding, and it's not even a language book, but I collect old textbooks. And this is one that interested me. I picked up, and it was originally published in 1845. My copy was published many years later in 1891, uh, but between 1845 and 1891, it went through 18 uh, new editions. It was enormously popular. It was one of the standard textbooks used for teaching mathematics all around, or arithmetic, all around the world, in the British colonies anyway. It was originally from Britain, and of course, Canada, a British colony, used it as well. So if it was so popular, if it was so popular, why is this book no longer used? This is a question you can ask yourself. Well, you look at it, and I think you're probably already starting to get a clue. It has a number of different problems with it that make it not so contemporary, not so interesting to young learners today. And even though the mathematics is not changed, one plus one still equals two. Uh, there are a series of problems. First of all, it has out of date examples. The examples are old. They're boring. Uh, it's not very motivating. As you see, it's page after page after page of text. There's no diagrams. There's no pictures. There's nothing else in there except text. Uh, so it's not visual. It doesn't present any visual organization of information. The approach was totally teacher-centered. It wasn't meant to be used as a book that students would work together or do anything else. And there was only individual study. Nowhere in the book, nowhere in the book does it ever say pair work, get into pairs, or get into a small group, or even do a presentation in front of the class. It's really the teacher was at the front of the class, the students were in their seats, and that's all that happened. Um, it was based on rote memory learning. So what does this mean, rote memory? Rote memory is to do with the idea that you uh, have to memorize everything, uh, w whether or not you understand it perfectly or not. And in the case of this book, they only taught everything once and once only. So they would teach one idea once, and then they would go to another idea, and then another idea, and so on and so forth. So it just keep uh, uh, it would just go through the book, but there was no revisiting, there was no review, there was no opportunity to say, okay, you learned this, now let's put it together with something new. And the assessment was sink or swim, which we mean you either pass or you fail. And often the questions were quite difficult, and they were aimed at tricking the students. So one question in the book, for example, was say, how many months with, uh, uh, with uh, 30 days are there in 400 years? <laughs> well, okay, well, you can sort of do the math on that and say, well, there's 12 months a year, 400 years, that would be uh, 400 times 12, that's 4,800. Uh, but the trick is leap year. So in February, of course, uh, they don't have uh, they don't have the 30th of the month every year. So it's just tricky, and it's trying to cheat the students out of marks. So all of these approaches were ones that had to be slowly, over time, replaced. And these were attitudes, old attitudes towards education, that in some cases we still see today. But but we're trying to slowly change. Okay, well, what do we need in a language textbook if this one really didn't work? What do we really need? Uh, well, this is a this is a saying that I, this is a very old saying that I love. It comes from Ali bin Abi Talib, and uh, he said, "Do not raise your children the way your parents raised you. They were born for a different time." And I think all of us agree 
that uh, all of us were probably born and educated uh, in a time when computers were just becoming popular, or in my case, well before uh, uh, <laughs> computers were popular. And and now it's different, and now it's different. Um, now everybody is born in the computer age, and they're growing up using computers and all digital devices. So they have different needs, and their jobs that they will have, and the way they will learn is fundamentally different than the ways in which we were educated. So how are they different? Well, first of all, everyone expects each student to succeed. No student goes to school or to high school or to university or anything else today saying, oh yes, maybe I'll pass, maybe I'll fail, I don't know. You know, No, they expect that they're going to succeed. But moreover, their parents expect that they will succeed, and so do their teachers. The second point is that students need lifelong learning strategies. Now, I'm sure many of you have been teaching for many, many years. I've been teaching for more than 25 years. And uh, in my case, in my case, you know, none of my students from 25 years ago phone me up and say, oh, oh, Professor Ken, I forget how to conjugate the verb to be. Nobody does that, right? It, it, of course, they actually go out of my classroom, they go into the world, and they're helping themselves to learn. But they need strategies to do that. How do they use a dictionary to look up a new word? Or how do they learn through context? So they need those strategies and we have to help them with it. And the third point is students need to deal with much more than printed words. Again, going back to that old textbook, it was only printed words, no diagrams. But when you think about what students have to read today, it includes charts and diagrams and uh, graphs, timelines, photographs, illustrations, maps, and you know I could go on. Uh, ours is a very visual world. And the World Wide Web has made that even more so. When you look on the internet and any page, it's cluttered with graphics and new, new ways of presenting the information. So in fact, our, our, what we need to teach has also changed. Okay, so let's talk about a number of different ideas. And uh, I'm sure you're looking at this picture saying, what is that? What is that? Well, uh, that, I have to tell you, is a book wheel, a book wheel. And uh, the book wheel was an invention that could allow someone to easily go back and forth between different books and read them. So if you re were reading one book but maybe you wanted to look, uh, look up a word in a dictionary, you would turn it around and go to the next book. Okay, we'll come back to that in a second. But the first idea is that technology often faces opposition. And maybe you're one of those teachers that thought, oh, no, I don't want a computer in my classroom. No, thank you. Um, and this is, this is an old idea, and I love this quote. It says, this invention will produce forgetfulness in the minds of those who use it because they will not practice their memory. And it's true. I'm sure all of you are thinking right now, Google, right? Uh, people don't think anymore. They just Google it right away as their, as their default. So the students are always Googling the information. But this is not a recent statement. This is an old statement. It was written by uh, uh, Socrates said this. He didn't write it. Plato re reported it, uh, his student Plato. And it was written in 370 BCE, so it was very, very old. He, and he wasn't talking about Google and iPhones. He was talking about books. He who receives books in the belief that anything in writing will be clear and certain would be an utterly simple person <laughs> and, in truth, ignorant. So, okay, all right, this is very old. But we understand that people from a long time ago uh, have always been opposed to new technologies. And in, in Socrates' case, the new technology for him was books. Okay, the second point, the second of the five points are that things are not going to go back to the way they were. So we have this expression, we let the genie out of the lamp, the genie, the, the magical creature out of the lamp. The, the genie is not going to go back into the lamp, not willingly. And things are not going to change. We have, we have, the, we have computers in the classroom now, the students are using iPhones. We can either say, okay, they're not allowed, not allowed, not allowed, or we can just accept it and work with it to get the most out of it. The third point is uh, back to our book wheel, which we see was invented in 1588. Uh, we say that the more things change, the more they stay the same. So we had this book wheel idea of wanting to have access to many books at the same time. 
But today on my iPhone, I have that. I can read books on my iPhone and I've got a whole library on my iPhone and also other devices like my Kobo or Kindle. Uh, so, so what's interesting here is, yes, of course the technology has changed, but really what's happened is the desire has stayed the same, that access to new information. But the ways in which we access that information has changed through technology. So that's, uh, that's been an important one. The fourth of the fifth is something said by William Gibson. Now, William Gibson is not a teacher. He's actually a science fiction author. But he wrote something interesting. He said that technology starts to become invisible invisible. What does he mean technology becomes invisible? Well, he mentioned things like a light switch, a light switch. And we don't think about this, but we go into a room and we turn on a light switch and the light comes on. The whole technology that makes that work, uh, the power plant that generates the electricity, the wires that bring it to your house, everything else has kind of disappeared. and We kind of forget about it. But even more so, now I walk into, uh, walk into dark rooms sometimes and there's an automatic light switch that senses that I'm there and it turns on the lights for five minutes and then, and then you walk out. Many washrooms, for example, have this. Uh, so this technology becoming invisible is partly a, about us forgetting or forgetting that the technology is even there because it simply becomes part of our lives and we no longer think about it. And that's an increasing trend. And the fifth point is that an unexamined technology is not worth using. So what do we mean unexamined? Well, we have to question everything. And now I've mentioned all these things about, okay, technology is coming. You can't get rid of it. It's becoming invisible. It's becoming part of our lives. But at the same time as teachers, we can't just say, oh, well, I guess it's okay then. We still have to examine everything. And we have to think, what can I get out of this for my students? How can I best use this in new and interesting ways? Okay, so now have some technologies tried and failed? Of course, many do. And technologies, as we see, are being replaced all the time. This was probably the most exciting technology when I was in grade one and two. It was the film strip projector. And I remember Mrs. Babcock saying, oh, Kenny, would you help me with the film strip projector? <laughs> and, and that was a great job just turning it forward. Yeah, of course, we, we get many new technologies and some of them are there for a little while and then they're replaced. They're replaced with new technology. Um, so let's look at some of those technologies that have come and gone and ask ourselves two questions. So I want to give a little history about technology and education. Uh, so what has been the impact of technology on language learning? So we have to think about that. And how interactive is each one? So we can start off 3300 BC and we can look at the cuneiform tablets that we find in ancient Sumeria. I've had friends from uh, Iraq who have told me that, oh yes, if you walk out into the desert, you just find these everywhere, like shards of them or broken ones or whole ones. Why is that? Well, they were made out of clay and uh, the ancient Sumerians would use their stylus and uh, make their little characters on it. But when the clay dried, it would be quite, quite strong. But moreover, if the clay was baked, uh, it would become as hard as, you know, any pot or my coffee cup like that. And of course, if you buried it for many years, nothing would change. Why did it bake? Well, sometimes a house or a library or a whole city would burn down and the fires would bake these. So they're very durable. So here we have something interesting. The, uh, um, the technology lasts for a long time, but at the same time, it couldn't be changed after something was written on it. So it, was, it wasn't like you could take an eraser and change it. On the other hand, some new technologies disappear almost all the time. I, uh, my own PhD work, I created a CD-ROM, and now there's no computer that can play the CD-ROM because the operating system from you know 2001 no longer uh, is on computers, and they don't recognize the CD-ROM. So things change. So here we have an example of something old that still we can still read, but I have something new that we cannot read at all. So those things change. Uh, move forward in time quite a bit. This was a big, big move. Uh, this was uh, the Orbis Sincilium Pictus. 
and it was one of the most popular books of the age for hundreds of years. And what it did was something very simple. It introduced pictures, pictures in printed books, and pr of course printed books were new at that time. So it introduced these printed books there where you had pictures that made it easier to understand and learn. So these books became very popular as translation devices and you could see English and Latin on these pages. So for somebody who knew some Latin or knew some English, it would teach them one or the other. So it was adapted into editions and brought over to uh, even to America. Uh, they ended up using this one. Um, but a late so this was a late idea in education though that materials should make it easy to learn and so this was like a new idea like somebody this uh, Comenicus who developed these uh, he was a Swiss teacher he thought well it's not easy enough to learn if they're just reading text so he tried to make it easier for them so that was a new idea in technology moving forward a Boston teacher in 1728 uh, offered the first courses by mail and this was a shorthand course how to write shorthand that symbols that make it faster to write something down and uh, in this case in this case uh, it was a technology began to see uh, be seen as a way of educating a wider population who couldn't attend to school when they were free to learn so many people wanted to learn shorthand but they couldn't you know necessarily go to school so this technology of the mail stu uh, uh, service made it possible for them to learn in different places and at different times and I know what you're thinking you're thinking ah that's what we're doing right now we're doing a webinar right now and you're all in diff we're all in different places and later if you want to share this video with a friend you will be in a different time so it's this ideas of learning but you think before this time before this point that was that this was a new idea a new idea in education moving forward the postal things uh, the British Postal Service with the introduction of the one penny stamp uh, uh, made correspondence courses um, possible um, just by the way if you see one of these stamps they're worth like five hundred thousand dollars so uh, so grab onto it look through your old letters from your aunts and uncles okay so of course that moved on to distance education degrees of different kinds uh, here we see Queen Victoria giving knowledge to the Africans there's a terrible very racist uh, there's another one very much like this uh, it's almost a exactly the same except the uh, the person who is kneeling there is from India so again it was the idea of, of, of England giving education to the world that was sort of the the motif that was here but in fact it was it was something that they had started to do and distance education degrees in 1858 came about Similar things in other countries, in Boston, the Society to Encourage Studies at Home started to do the same thing in 1873, but a big difference was in 1938. This was a really big technology that changed the world in many ways, the radio, the radio. By 1938 in the United States, at least 200 city school systems 25 state boards of education and many universities and colleges broadcast educational programs for public schools. Okay, it's interesting, but it was not interactive. It was not interactive, which is the theme of today's talk. Why? Because it was only coming in one direction. But what was really interesting for us as teachers is why were they doing this? Why were they doing this? Well, it turns out the reason was not very good. Uh, this is something that was written at the time, and they wanted technology to be a master educator. So they said that experts in given fields broadcast lessons for pupils within the many school rooms of the public school system, asking questions, suggesting readings, making assignments, and conducting tests. So you could do all of this by radio. This mechanizes education and leaves the local teacher only the tasks of preparing for the broadcast and keeping order in the classroom. Are you kidding me? Really? So you could see, you could see an attitude back then 
which is still common today. So like the book wheel and the iPhone library that I showed you, we see that a lot of the ideas, they change, uh, they change the technology, but the ideas are still there. And this was a common idea that what, what, what people wanted to do was to use technology to replace teachers. Of course, it never happened, and today we no longer have radios in the classroom. Although we do have some things like the Khan Academy trying to do the same thing in different ways. The teacher's uh, job is just really to replace, um, is just to take order in the classroom. Okay, let's move forward. The University of Houston televised credit courses. So all of a sudden the television, and again, this is a very sexist picture. Yeah, and this is embarrassing, I know. Here's the husband watching television. The wife is adjusting it for him like a servant. Uh, not very nice. Uh, but in but one interesting thing about this idea was that technology tried to imitate the school experience. So in this way, they were trying to add something to radio. They were trying to add the visual elements because, of course, radio couldn't do anything visual. So here you've got visual and you could have teachers standing up and giving lectures in that way and showing you things, showing you things. Uh, this continued in different ways and with the uh, advent of the Internet, uh, the University of Phoenix Phoenix offered BA and MA courses in 1989. I teach in a program that's online. I teach graduate students and doctoral students. And uh, we have meetings uh, each year in person, face to face. But I teach most of my classes from wherever I am when I'm traveling. I even taught one course once when I was on a cruise ship. I was on a boat and uh, they had Wi Fi so I could teach it there. Interesting. In 1991, the whiteboard came about. And the whiteboard was actually a surprisingly interesting innovation. And why is it a, a little bit different? And was it really necessary? Well, yes, all of a sudden you could put a lot of materials onto the board that you couldn't put up there before. But it actually increased interaction in a number of different ways. First of all, uh, first of all, one big thing about the whiteboard is you can get all the students' eyes on you. So instead of the students all looking down at their books, they're looking at the teacher. So the teacher can see their faces because they're looking at the board. Uh, so that happened. But of course, a blackboard could do that. But also the interaction on the board. You could touch it. You could change things. You could move things around. Uh, you could fill in answers and do things, change colors, do things like that. So that became a new way of interaction in the classroom. And, you know, it seemed to be quite popular. It seemed to be quite popular. I go, I, I travel around the world a lot, uh, going to conferences and giving talks. And I see them in classrooms in every country. Um, in uh, WebCT, WebCT in 2003, that's actually invented at my, my first university, uh, the University of British Columbia, uh, where I went to university. And in 2003, they invented this system for online teaching. It really quickly grew to 6 million students, 40,000 instructions, 150,000 courses, uh, uh, 1,350 institutions in 55 countries, and it spread since then. It's really grown, but it's also been replaced. People have found new learning systems uh, that maybe operate a little better, do something a little different, are a little easier, are a little more accessible in different ways. But an interesting thing about the, uh, this, uh, this WebCT uh, interactive uh, classroom technology was that teachers began to package their curriculum and share it in bits and pieces. So teachers were interacting with each other. Uh, they were saying, oh, yes, I'm teaching a course on this. You can take my course and teach it somewhere else or adapt it in your own way. So that became a very popular way of sharing information. So that was quite interesting and quite different. Uh, 2003 also, it saw the development of phone apps for the first time. And if you have a phone, you've got phone apps. And among those phone apps were language learning apps. And that just the example here is from Thailand. And you can see there's many different kinds if you want to learn to speak Thai. Um, this saw a shift. This, uh, this signaled a shift towards individualized learning. 
on mobile devices and social media based learning. So all of a sudden this was changing and one of the examples uh, was Cafe Mocha. Cafe Mocha was an early example of this. Some of you may have seen this. Unfortunately it was bought uh, by another company and now it's been uh, disbanded. It's, it's been uh, closed down. But uh, it was uh, it was an interesting one uh, because of the way it started. Uh, uh, a father uh, and, and a, a couple had taken their uh, teenage children to Madrid. They were from San Francisco. They took their teenage children to Madrid for um, a vacation. And the father was thinking to himself, well, our kids study Spanish in school. They should be able to help us. They should be our tour guides in Spain. It would be great because he didn't speak Spanish himself. He only spoke English. And so, but when they got there, he found that his kids weren't very good. They actually, a lot of their language was uh, not suited for everyday questions that they wanted to ask in museums and galleries and things like that. So what they did was, uh, so what the kids did is they would go and they would come home at night and then they would go on to Facebook or some other social media and they would ask their friends. They would say, how do you say this in Spanish? Or what was this? You know, can you tell me this? And they would be Skyping their friends and saying, well, what about this? No, how do you pronounce that again? And he had an idea. He had an idea. How about other learners teaching each other? How could, how could you, if you spoke one language, could you connect with other people who spoke another language and could you talk? So this was a new use of social media, social media for uh, language teaching and learning. And it quickly grew to have uh, 400,000 students a day. 400,000 a day were using this service and communicating with each other and trading information. So a typical example for, uh, was, uh, was a young boy in Morocco. Um, he spoke French, but he spoke the Moroccan street French. So there was a French businessman who wanted to go to Morocco, but he wanted to be cool, cool. He wanted to go to the nightclubs. He wanted to talk to other people and casual local language. So the boy taught him and uh, in exchange, the boy gets some points because what the boy really wanted to do was use those points to pay somebody to learn German. So a kind of a bartering exchange system. So a number of different interesting things going on there in the shift to social media based learning. A major difference in 2007 that a lot of us have heard about now is the flipped classroom. The flipped classroom. And it really came about because of these two guys. These two guys. They look like a comedy team, I know. Uh, the term flipped classrooms was popularized by teachers Aaron Sams and John Bergman from Woodland Park High School. So they were secondary school teachers. They were teaching teenagers. They were in Colorado and in 2007 they realized that the class time would be best spent guiding knowledge and providing feedback rather than uh, delivering direct instruction. So they flipped the paradigm. They flipped the paradigm and they said, okay, instead of everybody in the class uh, just trying to learn, uh, you know, us teaching everything in the class, why don't they learn some of those things outside of class? Why don't they read their textbooks at home and come with their questions? Why don't they look at YouTube videos and other videos at home and then come with their ideas? And so they kind of changed the, flip the uh, metaphor of the classroom. So we always think about this and we think, oh my goodness, this is a new idea. I wish I would thought of that, right? Uh, the flipped classroom, it's a great idea. And since then, many uh, organizations such as the Khan Academy uh, started off with mathematics doing the same thing. In fact, Khan was, uh, was a financial analyst, worked on Wall Street, and uh, he was tutoring, tutoring his nieces and nephews who lived in Louisiana. So he's in New York, they're in Louisiana. So he started creating these little tu YouTube tutorials to teach them how to do mathematics, because of course he was very good at mathematics. So he's a good uncle, just being a good uncle. But what happened then? Uh, then they started sharing it with their friends, and their friends started sharing it with their friends. And suddenly everybody was uh, asking about this and wanting to learn more and more. And so the real realization came to him at one point when his nieces came to visit him for a holiday. And he said, oh, well, I can teach you, you know, let's go through your math. I can teach you some new things now. 
and they said, sorry, uncle, sorry, uncle, we prefer the YouTube video. He said, what do you mean? I'm right here. I can teach you in person. And they said, yes, but if you do the video, we can watch it again and again and again. So this is some other idea about the flipped classroom. This is the idea that actually maybe people can learn at their own pace. So it isn't just about isn't isn't just about you know learning the information in a different way or in a different place, but learning at their own pace by looking at the materials over and over again. And this is something that I say to teachers all the time because they complain. They say, "Oh, the students, you know, I have mixed ability classrooms. Some students understand easily; other ones take so long." And I said, well, do you have listening or do you have audio or videos in your classroom? He said, yes. I said, get those students, the weaker students, to listen to them uh, not once but ten times or a hundred times or a thousand times. Get them to keep listening to them, keep looking at them so that they're really going to be uh, have it in a much deeper way. And so they can do that. So this whole flipped classroom idea was not so much just about changing where students were learning things, but it was very much about letting students learn at their own pace. And in your own classrooms, I know, I know you have students at different levels. Okay, but is the flipped classroom a new idea? And this is a question that kind of bothers me a little bit because my, uh, my, my father's twin sister um, in 1930 was teaching in a classroom exactly like this. Uh, she worked in a very small community uh, where she was the only teacher and uh, they had a little classroom and all the students from the from the class came to uh, came to take lessons from her and she taught everything from grade from kindergarten to grade 12 in one room and in fact she was forced to sort of flip the classroom in some ways and you can see in this picture you can see the boys at the back are reading they're all reading their books uh, boys and the girls in the back and she, while she gives a lesson to the children in the front and you can see it's a, maybe a poor community. Some children are just coming without their shoes to school. And, uh, and it must be summer or spring. I see flowers on the table. Isn't that nice? But she's actually using some principles of the flipped classroom then. So what's different now? What's different now? Why has the flipped classroom suddenly become so popular today? Well, you probably already know the answer to that question. And the answer really has to do with technology. So technology has made an enormous difference because all of a sudden you can go outside of the classroom and get all of that information, all of that listening, all of that reading, all of that, uh, all of that videos, everything else on your own. But there's another big difference besides this idea of learning at your own pace, besides this idea of flipping the classroom, where you can get your information from, besides the, uh, the access to a lot of different information like the book wheel, uh, uh, the huge difference in technology is the personalization, the personalization of learning. So instead of always just, you know, listening to the teacher and following what the rest of the class are doing, suddenly, suddenly you're really able to learn from uh, along your own path. And each of us has a different path. We tend to think of our students as a class, as a class with, you know, one, you know, who are going forward. And we often, if we're teaching teenagers, we're often thinking, oh my goodness, when they graduate, will they be able to go to university? Or when they graduate, will they be able to go to university? You know, these are get a good job or go to university. This is often our concerns when we're teaching. Are we really preparing them for the future? But there is no one future for our students. Our students have many potential futures. There's many possible things they can do besides working, besides uh, getting a job, well, even, uh, you know, getting a job or going to university. In fact, there's countless things that they can do. Maybe they end up volunteering. Maybe they end up, uh, you know, uh, not working. Maybe they end up doing um, uh, university or college in different places in different ways. And of course, they're all studying different subjects and they're all going to get different jobs. So so for this reason, students also want to personalize their own education. They want to learn language that's useful for them. 
And in fact, they also want to reflect on their current lives and learn the language that is important to them now. So a student, for example, who is interested in martial arts, maybe wants to learn the language around martial arts or around uh, music or around skateboarding or around surfing or around, you know, bicycle racing or, or different sports. And that's the personalization that's happening right now that is so easy to do with technology. Students can Google anything that they want and read in depth and get a variety, a lot of different variety, a lot of variety of different perspectives on things. So that's a, that's a very important uh, opportunity for them. So let's look at this definition of this flipped classrooms. So I've got three here that and some of them are a little difficult to understand, but together they give us a better idea of what a flipped classroom is. So a flipped classroom is an instructional strategy uh, and it's a type of blended learning that reverses the traditional learning environment by delivering instructional content, often online, uh, outside of the classroom. It moves activities, including those that may have traditionally been considered homework, into the classroom. Uh, so again, there's a couple of words here that are that jump out at us, and that those are strategy. Strategy is very important, and blended learning. So strategy, of course, we know strategy is a, a way of doing something. Uh, we practice strategies over time, and they become skills. Uh, for example, learning how to read a book. Uh, I use different strategies. I start on page one, I go to the last page, unless it's a dictionary, then I've got another strategy. Or it's a timetable or a manual for something and I just look for what I need. Those are different strategies. Uh, when you think about them, they're strategies. When you forget about them and you just do them naturally, as easy as walking, then they become skills. The second part of this is the idea of blended learning. And blended learning is just simply means that you have a variety, the opportunity to learn in a variety of ways. Again, looking better at our old picture of the classroom uh, from the 1930s, you see blended learning there. Some students are reading, some are having a lecture. But now we have more options. They can learn from looking at the textbook, from listening to the teacher, but also looking on videos, uh, listening to uh, recordings, and uh, looking up information on their own in the classroom. Okay, here's another definition. Um, the flipped classroom describes a reversal of traditional teaching where students gain first exposure to a material outside of class, usually via reading or lecture videos. And then class time is used to do the harder work of assimilating that knowledge through strategies such as problem solving, discussion, or debates. Ah, okay, so this adds something to it. This adds something to our idea about the flipped classroom. So we're starting off, uh, first of all, the students do most of the heavy work outside of class. So we say, yeah, you should learn about this. You should read about this. But then when they come to class, we say, okay, do you really understand this? So we could, for example, say teaching the past progressive tense. Okay, read your books or look online, look at the video, whatever, about the past progressive tense. See if you see what you can learn. And then tomorrow, when you come to class, I'm going to test you on it. And I'm also going to see where we can help. And I'm going to give you opportunities to use it. So instead of just starting the class saying, okay, today we're talking about the you know, past progressive tense, you know, students have the chance to learn on their own before they come to class. And why is this important? Why is this important? Well, uh, one of the big problems in classroom teaching is that, again, this mixed ability where some students maybe already know it. Maybe they already know the past progressive tense. They don't need to spend so much time learning it. But in a classroom, we tend to teach everyone at the same pace. But those students who are really good at it, they don't even have to study. Those students who have never heard of the past progressive tense have no idea they need to study harder, but they're doing that work outside of the classroom. The third definition is the content exploration. Um, so this is, breaks it down in three th simple things. It says you explore the content, you make meaning of it, and you make personal meaning of it. What does it mean to me? How would I use that? And then you demonstrate it or you apply it in some way. So you can see the content exploration happens at home. The students are doing that on their own. 
the meaning making, they're trying to understand what's going on there. And then finally, the demonstration or the application. Come to class, show me. Show me the teacher that you can do it, that you know how to do it, that you can apply it, that you can write an essay or give a talk or do something else. So this is the simplest and easiest way to sort of understand this. How can we apply this? How can we apply these ideas? Well, uh, to make a flipped classroom work uh, and have these higher degrees of interactivity, um, uh, we can sort of look at four questions. Do we have a flexible environment? What about the learning culture? Uh, is there intentional content, which is mean is the content really important to the learners? And do we have a professional educator, somebody who is really actually quite good at doing this stuff? Okay, for the flexible environment, how do we create a culture in the classroom that supports flipped learning? Well, actually, it's not just the classroom. It's actually the school. Uh, I, I don't advocate, you know, starting from scratch and saying the whole school should do this on day one. Uh, but in your school, you might try it with one classroom as a test and see what works with your students and what doesn't work, and then gradually expand it to other classrooms. But creating a culture in the classroom means that the students need to accept it, but also maybe your, your head teacher or your principal or your headmaster needs to accept it as well and needs to think, okay, how can we make these principles work and change maybe the hours, change the organization of the desks, you know, change the way in which the teacher does uh, her job. The second one is the learning culture. How do we make students more responsible for their learning? Because many of you might think, oh yes, if I ask my students to do homework, they never do it. They never do it. Or they, they go home and they, you know, I can see them, you know, before class, like trying to finish the exercises. Will they really do that? Well, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to sort of shift, uh, shift this uh, culture and make students more responsible for their learning. But once they see the chance for personalization, for motivation, uh, they, they, the motivation increases. Once they see the chances to, that they can study only what they need to study to show, demonstrate uh, that, then they see it more realistic in terms of what they're learning. They're not just listening to things that they already know. So that's important. What about this intentional content? How do we decide what to teach and what, and when to, what to let students teach on their own? Well, that's, that's tough. It's tough. It's a hit and miss thing. And some things are easier to learn in the classroom than maybe outside. Some things like pronunciation in the language classroom. Uh, it might, you know, be a little bit easier or some grammatical concepts, but other ones, they might go on and learn more online. How do we prepare ourselves as teachers for the flipped classroom? Well, in fact, we do many of these things, but we have to shift our attitude from working with the whole class to often working with just small groups. Uh, because uh, when, when students are, are studying at different paces and different rates, uh, not all of them will need all the help at the same time. So in the classroom, you would say, hey, okay, all right, okay. So everybody's been studying grammar, uh, the past progressive tense last night. Let's get together. Those who need some extra help, uh, I want to see what you can do, first of all. And if you need some extra help, I'm just going to meet with six students right now. And, and, and you, you change the attitudes, the organization of the classroom. You have to be more flexible. Do we really need a classroom technology? When I first started teaching in China, um, I, uh, I was I was talking to Andy Curtis and Rod Ellis, two other prominent professors, and they uh, and we were we were having a, we were just having dinner one night, and I said, oh yes, well I taught in a classroom in China. Uh, in the 1980s and I had an overhead projector. So I was telling students how to use an overhead projector and how to use, uh, how to use uh, a, a tape recorder and a photocopy machine to help in their technology. And they said, oh, maybe Saturday you could come visit one of our classrooms. And I didn't, and I said, oh, I'd be delighted to. But when I went to visit the classroom, I saw, oh, in their classroom, they had no technology. In fact, the only technology they had was a blackboard. And they had four walls of blackboards, and they did not have desks. They only had stools for the students to sit on. So Andy said, oh, that's nothing. That's nothing. He said, uh, Andy said, when I went to a classroom in India, and they had no walls. I said, what do you mean? He said, the school was on a blanket on, on, in, in, in the, on the dirt. And the students would come and sit on the blanket or the carpet. 
and and the teacher would just talk to them at the beginning and if they wanted to write they would put their fingers into the dirt and they would write their letters or numbers and then uh, then Rod Ellis of course who has to top it he says that's nothing that's nothing <laughs> he turned to him and he says I went to a school without a teacher <laughs> and we said well, how did that work he said and he worked in Africa and he said the teacher the teacher in this uh, country where I was he said uh, was also the taxi driver so they would have the classes outside uh, they would be sitting on the ground under a tree and he would come to teach them but then if he got a phone call someone needed a taxi he would go and then the students would wait around so do we need technology to learn of course not of course not but technology makes it a little bit better and we're living in the 21st century now where we have a concern about very particular skills so we have to have skills we have to have content we have to have some context and we have to have some tools that are all a little bit different. So I'm going to be using some examples from this uh, new series, Wider World, which we've been talking about this week. This uh, this week, I, I I didn't write this book. I'm just uh, I'm just very interested in it because of the way in which it presents information. Our, our one of the things that I realize is that our technology continues to evolve. And here's a here's a, a version of sort of Skype that was used uh, from 1907, and it was of course it was just a cartoon about people getting their information in different ways from antennas on their head. But well, we see that again that desire has evolved into new technologies and the ways in which we learn are changing in terms of the paradigms and that includes the level of instruction, the time, the role of online components, the teacher's role, the student's role, the support that we give to students and the student to teacher ratio. Just very briefly uh, what we're talking about now in many of our high schools, uh, secondary schools, a single course, a modified schedule where we can have a flipped classroom. And technology is used to enhance traditional instruction, but it's also used to transform it in new ways, to teach in new ways that we couldn't uh, do it before. Uh, so the teacher leads the instruction, of course, but in some cases the teacher is just supporting the instruction, letting the students learn on their own. Teacher driven, of course, uh, living, learning is still ha happening, but we have also so saying, okay, you do a project, I'm going to be here to guide you. And we also encourage students to learn on your own. If you're interested in a topic, here, go online and learn some more about it. And then we have school-based mentoring system because, again, we have responsibilities as teachers to make sure legally it's being covered. And we still have a traditional classroom ratio. What do students need to succeed in the 21st century? Well, they, as I say, we need these skills, we need content, we need different context and tools. The skills are ones to decode visual things, uh, both visual on video and, uh, and, and things like photographs and charts and pictures. The content has to be up to date. The book that I showed you at the very beginning was very outdated. It was outdated content. Nobody today would be interested in learning about shipbuilding and farming when they're studying mathematics. Um, the context is going to be quite different uh, because the students, what are they going to use the language for? We're educating more students in English than we ever did before. Students who 100 years ago never would have learned English. And the tools to do that, again, are all those technology tools that we have. So interactivity, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, is, doesn't necessarily have to be just technology-based. Textbooks provide interactivity if they present choices instead of simply close-ended tasks. And I love this one as an example. You start here and it's like a little game. You know, I want to work indoors or I prefer an outdoor job. And then it leads you in different ways. It's interactive because every student can choose their own path can look at it their own particular ways in, in terms of what they want to learn. Listening is another level of interaction. So when you have listening things, again, students can listen to them over and over and over again. And you see we're starting to combine the skills. They're listening, but maybe they're also reading. So reading, they have to write something, listening, reading, writing, and then they talk about it with uh, their partner or in groups. So you've got reading, writing, listening, and speaking all happening together. So even though this section says listening and vocabulary, it's really talking about all four skills, not just listening. 
Um, watching video engages students in additional ways, including facial expressions and gestures. So uh, they, they see things, uh, they, instead of just listening and imagining what the people are doing, uh, they see, oh, hand gestures or expressions, my goodness, you know, what's going on? And they start to mirror those because they're learning them in those ways. So, uh, so this wider world is quite impressive because it offers three different kinds of videos, not just one. And the different videos have different purposes that are quite interesting. So the first one is something called Vox Pops. And these are interviews on the streets with people uh, who are not native English speakers. And so here we see Marianne and Mireia from Spain, Kyle from Brazil, and Mary from Austria talking. And in each case, they have accents because, because although there are 350 million people in the world who speak English as a native language, there are 750 million people who speak it as a second language. So this gives exposure to non-native English speakers. How do students feel when they hear people from their first language group speaking? If you're from Spain studying English and you say, oh, those girls are from Spain, it sort of gives you a relationship to the content that makes it more real for you. And you see how other people struggle. So how do students imagine themselves struggling in an interview situation? So the struggle mirrors teenagers' interactions with the world. And Arthur Kostler wrote, in any language, it is a struggle to make a sentence say exactly what you mean. <laughs> I know what he says. Uh, and for teenagers learning English as a second language, it's even more so. They struggle. But the struggling is the way in which we learn. And when students see other students struggling, it helps them feel more confident themselves. They say, okay, it's not just me struggling. Everybody does this. The second part are Pearson dramas. And this takes the vocabulary and the grammar and the theme of the unit, and it puts it all together in something that it finds it easy for students to understand. So these Pearson dramas are the, uh, in this particular one, uh, there's this boy who's just written a song on his guitar. He wants to share it with this girl and he goes over to her house, but she wants to watch something on TV because it's one of her uh, favorite musicians playing. So he's kind of like very disappointed with this, that she wants to listen to the video rather than listen to him. So it's a little drama set up, but it's really targeting the language. Well, this gives exposure to native English speakers, practicing the key vocabulary and grammar, of course. So how do students imagine themselves in this dramatic situation? Well, they can see themselves there and they say, yes, this has happened to me before, maybe in some other way. I've been ignored while somebody wanted to do something else. How does the modeling help students? Well, they can see how they do it again, not just what the words that they're saying, but the physical actions that they have. So this modeling is extremely important, not just for the words, but for how we say those words, because that makes an enormous difference. The third one, the third type of video, are the BBC cultural videos. And this is first language material. This is authentic material. Uh, the first one is authentic because you're interviewing speakers on the street. The second one is constructed because it's built around the grammar and vocabulary. But the third one is uh, authentic. And this gives exposure to native English programs. How does it help students to encounter authentic materials related to the book? Well, they've just been learning about, in this case, dance, and now they see somebody speaking in native English about dance, and they sort of say, oh, I understand this much, or, or I don't understand. How do they relate to the topic? They see, okay, what I know, and here's something moving me forward a bit. This talks, this relates to what Lev Vygotsky talks about, the zone of proximal development. What the students can do without guidance, or with or without guidance. And so there's some things that they can't do. This is the same diagram and presented in another way. We say at the bottom there's a comfort zone of, I can do this now. And the learning zone is what I can do with some help. And then suddenly anxiety, no, I can't do that. I can't say that, right? But, uh, but Vygotsky said what a child can do in cooperation today, he can do alone tomorrow. So it's a great inspiration to us. So Wider World presents a lot of opportunities for learning in different ways like that. And one of them is, again, that with this active teach, which means you can put it up onto the board and have all the videos and text and everything else on the board. And again, the student's eyes are on the teacher and on the board instead of just looking into a book. Uh, the student e-text and the teacher e-text in My English Lab or other components. 
My English Labs gives grade book, common error reports to students, it assigns tasks. And you can see the high degree of interactivity here, where they are able, they're able to go on and do this on their own outside of class. And while they're doing that, they're getting feedback and information. The diagnostics will actually say you need more work in this particular area. Okay, that's great. That's great for learning. That's great for learning. But what about production? Because, of course, we know you learn a language by using it, using it. So what about production? What digital opportunities are there for students to have interactive uh, production tasks? Well, here's a task. Here's a task. And, you know, it goes through. And this is about, uh, this is talking about a town. So it describes somebody else's town. It, uh, it gives you some survey results about it. But then it goes on to ask this question at the end. Uh, what are the best and worst things about your town? Now, they watched a video about this. They've listened to things about this. But they want to tell the class. Use the survey answers in exercise five in the vo vocabulary box to help you. So they're talking about the best and worst things. Uh, what can they do digitally as a production task? Easy. Every single student I know now has a phone. They've got a mobile phone. And that mobile phone has a camera on it. It's got an audio recording device and it's got video. So instead of the students just, you know, doing an assignment standing in front of the class, they can do a little video for the class. Um, how does this enhance motivation, learning, and memory? Well, it's motivating because they're talking about something that they really know, their local town. How do they learn? Well, actually, as soon as they do that, they have to talk about their town in English. They're going to uh, learn and understand it a great deal more. And in terms of memory, every time they walk outside the door of the classroom and they see the library, think, ah, oh, in English, library, uh, the bank, ah, oh, in English, bank. And they're going to remember things because they're exposed to the language outside. So the big question we have at the end of this is, will the use of technology reduce the time required to learn a language? I'm not sure. It still takes probably about 250 hours to move from one band to another band uh, of language. But there's other benefits. There's other benefits. There's benefits beyond, uh, beyond just simply trying to learn faster. And that's to learn more deeply and more personally and more locally. So how can technology help collaborate with the community, bringing it into the classroom? I just want to end with this one little example here of, of an experience that I had uh, two years ago. I was at a conference and there was this woman there and she was part of a First Nations Aboriginal uh, performance. So she was giving a little, uh, they were singing and things, but I got to meet her and talk to her a little bit and I found out that actually she's 84, 84 years old at that time and uh, she uh, taught um, she taught this very special language to Kalabs to Sek Web and I can't even pronounce it. Uh, but there were only f three speakers of her language left, and she was one of them. Uh, the people who understood the speak uh, this or could speak somewhat was about 197, and people were learning the language. 178 of them. Actually, the population of this tribe, the total population, was only a, a over just over a thousand people, and she was helping to keep the language alive. How did she do that? She taught through Skype. The university asked her, said, would you like to teach some courses? She said, yes, but I'm not leaving my house. They can come to my house. They said, oh, maybe you could use Skype. So she was using uh, 84 years old, using this old technology to teach an old language in new ways. Okay, so what do we see after all this? In conclusion, we can say that interactivity happens between teachers, between learners, uh, between materials and the community. So teachers, learners, materials, and the community come together and interact in new ways for us to teach. Technology can help us to enhance those interactions. Of course, we could still have a one-room schoolhouse, but we don't. And we have to accept the technology that we have now and to make the most out of it. Uh, my name is Dr. Ken Beattie. Uh, I have a website, uh, kenbeattie.ca. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can take your questions now. And, uh, and uh, again, just to remind people, you will get a recording of this afterwards. And if you were wanting a certificate, you will see the certificate later. Nikki, Nikki, how are we doing? Do you have some questions? Oh, thank you so much for that. That was brilliant. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, 
can we say that technology solves the problem for students who learn in a different way to the traditional way? Yes, I think quite often it does. If those students, for example, uh, not everybody does, if they prefer learning on their own, and that typically involves shy students. A lot of students are very shy about speaking out in class, and maybe they're shy also because if they think they don't understand something perfectly, they don't want to speak. Many of us are nervous in that way. that We don't want to make fools of ourselves in a classroom. So in being able to go again, back to that audio recording, back to that video recording, and back to the textbook materials, and read them and listen to them and watch them, not just once or twice, but 10 or even 100 times, can build up the confidence in the students so that when they do come to class, especially in a flipped classroom, they can show what they know. They can show what they know to everybody and uh, makes them more confident. Okay, one more. Uh, you mentioned that uh, several ideas for interactive projects, are these in the teacher's book? Oh, in the teacher's book, yeah. Uh, a lot of these ideas, no. I, I just mentioned some ideas really at the top of my head, but they're very common sense. The teacher's book does have a wealth of different activities and materials and projects for students, and it has alternatives that you can look at, but, uh, but you have to just use your imagination and you have to use the imagination of the students. So you say to the students, instead of just saying, walking into class every morning and saying, okay, we're going to be talking about uh, the conditional tense today. Uh, say, okay, we're gonna talk about the conditional tense. What do you think would be a good way to learn that? And maybe they've got some ideas and those ideas probably involve some technology and that can help you in some ways to learn, uh, to, to help them to learn, yeah? And um, we've just had another one. Um, can we find any technology dis disadvantages by teaching? Of course, of course. There's lots of disadvantages, and that's when people don't use the technology properly. Um, we often have the question of, for example, well, if the students have their mobile phones in a classroom, that's all they do. They just walk. They're they're on Facebook. They're doing other things. So it takes a certain amount of discipline, but anything, any kind of technology, you have to somehow find you know, the best ways to use it. And that's knowing your students, and that's why teaching is such an individual and tailored activity. So you have to say, okay, phones out, phones away, phones you know, on the desk, face down, you know, things like that. You just create some things that will uh, allow you to work with your students in responsible ways. But truly, if you give them enough work, they're gonna be doing the work, rather than looking at their phones on Facebook because they have they know they have to do that on time. So it's part it's mostly a question of classroom management. Brilliant. Um just uh, one last one. What do you prefer, iClassroom teaching or distance? Uh, okay, face to face or or distance uh, <laughs> classroom teaching. Um, well, I'm very fortunate I get to do both, and uh, for me, uh, the reasons why I like each one is a bit different. So, um, for example, uh, uh, I cannot, in this particular case, I'm talking to many people out there. This uh, we, we have 170 or something, 166 people right at this moment, and all of you are you know, out there and listening, but you're all over the world in many, many different countries, so I could never reach you if I just came all this way just to see you once. In other cases, of course, it's great for me to go face-to-face -face, uh, with a classroom and I can do more things and I'm getting more feedback. In fact, in that case, there's actually more interactivity for me because I can see when I say something, you know, you say smile, or you're nodding your head. So when I say make a joke and nobody laughs, I think, okay, maybe nobody understands. I better start over. So there's actually more interactivity face-to-face. -face. But I do like the combination and I think that's where we're headed. A little bit of uh, interactive face-to-face, uh, -face, a little bit of online for person, more personalized, more localized learning, and I think that's the future of education for all of us. Uh, we often say that teachers, um, teachers uh, who understand technology will not replace, uh, um, you know, technology will not replace teachers, but teachers who understand technology will replace teachers who do not. That's a, that's a common saying, yeah. That's a good point. Right, Ken, thanks very much. I'm just going to read you one very nice comment from right. Lena. Uh, thank you a lot, Ken. It was one of the most splendid seminars in my life. You are doing a really great job. Thanks once more. Thank <laughs> you. I'm very humbled. And, uh, and Lena, I hope to see your webinar someday. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's a lesson to you and, and, and changes your teaching in some positive way. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
Brilliant. Thanks very much, uh, Ken. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, for everyone who listened this week, it's been a fantastic week for everybody. And, of course, as Ken said, you'll get the recording in a couple of days. Okay, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.